You want a good story? Well, you're in the right place to hear wholesome tales of wit, wisdom, and intrigue. Gather round for stories of inventors, entrepreneurs, entertainers, survivors, and the occasional villain. We'll travel through time and discover the people who've helped shape our world. You never know who you'll hear about or what you might learn. Everyone has a story. This is episode number four, The Man on the Can. The savory aroma of cooked garlic and onion wafted through the kitchen and into the dining room. The tang of tomatoes and Italian cheese added to all the deliciousness that was simmering on the stove. Finally, a bouquet of herbs and spices to marry the flavors. Can we have the recipe? I want to make it at home. It was a common request from guests at Ettore's restaurant. In 1914, Europe was on the brink of a war that would consume much of the Western world. In Italy, 16-year-old Ettore left his home and set sail for new opportunities in America. Arriving at Ellis Island, Ettore brought with him something that would help shape the country he soon called home, his love for Italian cuisine. Since the age of 10, Ettore knew his destiny was in cooking. It was in his very DNA. To his family, food was life. He later mentioned they had a real understanding of food. They'd grown up in kitchens. Food was really their education. His professional journey began in the kitchen of New York's prestigious Plaza Hotel. He worked alongside his brother, but it was Atore's culinary talent that was noticed. When President Woodrow Wilson married Edith, the nation's new first lady at the Greenbrier Hotel in the Allegheny Mountains of West Virginia, Atore directed the catering for the wedding reception. The president was so pleased with his work that Atore was hired as the catering supervisor for the White House Kitchen. In the early 1920s, Atore and his family moved to Cleveland, Ohio. He initially worked as a chef at the Hotel Winton, but the popularity of his Italian cuisine eventually led to the opening of his own restaurant in 1924. He called his restaurant the Girardino di Italia, that is, the Garden of Italy. Ettore's Italian dinners became somewhat of a phenomenon as talk of the special dishes he prepared began to spread across the Midwest. At this time in history, Italian food was relatively new to most American people. Not only did people line up to get a taste of his famous cook-to-order dishes, they also begged him for his recipes. Well, not wanting to disappoint the patrons who continually asked how to prepare his delicious food themselves, Ettore decided to do better than to simply send them home with a recipe. He assembled takeout meal kits that included dried pasta, cheese, and milk bottles filled with his famous sauce, along with instructions on how to cook and assemble the dish at home. When his take-home spaghetti kits became so popular that their revenue surpassed the restaurant dine-in sales, Ettore and his wife began working on what they recognized as a business opportunity. What if we started jarring our sauce and selling it? Would it sell? Would it sell? The question is almost laughable. If only they could have known how that small idea would grow. With the help of two regular restaurant patrons who happened to be grocery store owners, they began packaging and distributing Ettore's meal kits across the country. Well, the demand for the meal kits soon outgrew what they could supply from their restaurant kitchen. So in 1928, the family designed and built a small canning facility. In 1929, the stock market crashed, and the Great Depression saw many businesses struggle or go under. But Ettore's business surged and prospered. The reason? Ettore was producing high-quality, low-cost meals, affordable even for families battling economic hardships. As a result, Ettore's thrifty Italian meals became increasingly popular in American homes. In 1938, Ettore and his family moved their processing plant to Milton, Pennsylvania, closer to tomato fields and supplies of the fresh ingredients he used. Their factory was in continuous operation around the clock every day, just to keep up with the ever-increasing demand. When World War II broke out, Ettore found himself in opposition to the country of his birth, Italy. But Ettore was now an American, and his company played an important supporting role in the U.S. war effort. Ettore's cost-effective products were easy to ship and store, so his company was commissioned by the U.S. War Department to supply comforting meals to Allied troops stationed overseas. Devoted to his adopted country, 
Ettore took great pride in this commission and responsibility for feeding the troops. He hired additional staff to meet the wartime demand. Thousands of hungry troops enjoyed Ettore's meals overseas, and when they came back home, they were able to buy them in their local stores. The popularity of Ettore's meals increased, and his widely recognized products soon became established as a household name. Peace came, but Ettore still had his wartime workforce. He no longer needed all those employees, but he was committed to the workers who helped build his business. To keep them employed, Ettore sold his business to the larger American Home Products in 1946. An astute businessman, Ettore sold his successful company for nearly $6 million. Maybe that doesn't sound like much by today's standards, but factoring for inflation, that would be about $80 million in today's money. What's more, Ettore was a smart man, and he invested the resources from the sale in order to start and manage other business ventures. He also agreed to remain an advisor in the public face of his original company, a face that appeared in print advertisements and television commercials for decades. Ettore died in 1985, but you can still see his iconic image on product labels in the aisles of grocery stores everywhere, perhaps on the cans of ravioli or spaghetti and meatballs in your own pantry. You see, Ettore was a smart man, and he changed the spelling of his Italian birth name to make it easier to pronounce and more familiar to American ears. That's why you know Ettore Boyardi as Hector Boyardi, Chef Boyardi. And that's his story. Hey, I'm glad you were able to listen to this story, and I'm happy to be able to tell it. Share it with your friends and family, especially your kids. A fascinating story can open the door to a great conversation. If you like the story, give it a thumbs up on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening. Add it to your favorites so you can catch each story while it's fresh. You're listening to the Everyone Has a Story podcast, a production of realmedia.us. I'm Rodney Powell. I love to tell stories of businesses, narrating the kind of stories that make you feel something. If you're the one responsible for marketing in your organization, I'd love to hear from you. Let's talk about how to bring your story to life. In the meantime, there are many more stories to tell, and I'm here to keep telling them. Hope you join me again for other exciting tales of real people. Because everyone has a story. Mm-hmm.